You are listening to Revealing Real Estate Podcast, where we dive into getting over your fear of taking risk in real estate and making money while you sleep. I'm Nico Pedizano, your host and real estate guru with over 20 years of experience. It's time to get real. All right, we are excited for today's episode. Uh, you know, a lot of times here on the show, Revealing Real Estate, a big component of what we try to do and educate is helping people build uh, financial wealth through real estate and and becoming successful in real estate. And that is, you know, whether you're a contractor in the fix and flip business uh, or you're or you're an investor who just wants to generate some rental income and, and continue building that through inflation and and, and making money while you sleep, um, owning uh, or having the dream of home ownership uh, are very, very important aspects of creating success. And one of the main uh top frontliners for me to to start building wealth. And and I talk a lot about making sure that you surround yourself with the right people and having a right a very good team around you. Uh, thankfully, I'm a real estate agent, um, so I don't need another realtor that, that helps me to find real estate. But I surround myself with a very good lawyer. I make sure I surround myself with a very good financial advisor, somebody who's going to be able to find me money. I have different contractors that I work with that if I'm going to go into a fix and flip property, uh, builders, architects, but a real, real component. Uh, and, and quite often I have many conversations uh, with my accountants is making sure that you got somebody who's going to help you through the pro- process to allow you to not pay as much tax as you, as you want to pay. And I want people to understand that, you know, rich people really try to avoid or find ways not even to pay tax if there was ways around that. And there are ways to make sure that you can save uh, that money uh, and and to avoid making sure that you're going to be paying large amounts of taxes as well to the government. So on today's episode, I just want to introduce three very smart and important individuals, part of the Valenti Pasidi LLP group. Uh, we got Mark Colasante, Matthew Durante, and Luca Durante, who specialize in accounting, tax service, corporate re- uh, reorganizing, and most importantly, help advise business decisions. And a lot of their uh, my conversations with me are about my business decisions that I make, um, you know, yearly and quarterly. Um, so first and foremost, I want to, to welcome Mark to the show. Um, Mark Colasante, you, you've been an accountant for how many years now? Uh, we're approaching 10, 10 years, man. Time flies. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> welcome to the show, Mark. And Thank then you. we got, we got Matthew Durante, uh, and, and Luca Durante, two brothers to the show. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Yeah, Thank no sir. problem. Um, first and foremost, guys, I just want to first talk about your background story, maybe your background education, where you started. Uh, Mark, let's start with you. How did you want to start becoming a tax advisor? So it started, uh, back in high school. So I've known the guys to my right, uh, for over 10 years now. And uh, we did high school together, went to university together, and now we're working together. So you think we're sick of each other, but uh, not yet. Don't say that almost, yet. almost. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> um, it actually was in uh, high school. Uh, Matt, you know, asked, you know, what I want to do when I'm older. And Matt kind of knew he wanted to be an accountant. He's like, what do you, what do you want to do? And I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And he's like, oh, I want you to be an accountant, right? Now thinking back, I think you did that. So we can hey. eventually partner up together. Yeah, <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we went to university together and then from university, we all worked at a, a big firm and then uh, at the big firm, um, you know, Matt came to me and he said, you know, you want to do this, you want to open up our own shop, our own firm. And I said, okay, maybe let, let me think about it. And then uh, from there, we kind of decided to open up our own firm between myself, Matt and Luca. And now we're at the Valente Pasidi. So we're partners at a firm. It's located in Vaughan. Uh, it's a five partner firm. And we specialize, like you said, you know, in your real estate taxation. We do the accounting for real estate also, and also compilation, assurance engagements, tax reorganizations, and so forth. Uh, that's awesome. And um, and Matthew, yourself? Very similar to Mark. So like we said, we met in high school, and we went through Schuler together as well, too. And we also worked in the same firm. So we've seen each other quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Same with Luca as well, too. We were in school at the same time, right? There's a bit of an age gap there, but... And then um, ever since we were talking about me and Mark and, and Mark is more in the assurance, Luke is more in the assurance, I focus more on the tax side of it. So focusing on the tax side, I just decided more. So I kind of wanted to focus on saving people money and saving people, saving their taxes and just building structures and tax estate planning and corporate reorganizations that kind of help structure real estate investors, all kinds of industries and just focusing on what they actually enjoy and making sure that while they're doing it, they're doing it in the most efficient way possible. That's great. Uh, and Luca, yourself. 
yeah, so I think, um, so from an early age, I think I kind of knew I wanted to be an accountant. Um, so what I did was I went to Schulich and then I graduated and I did my master's there as well. And then um, I went to the big four firms, kind of specialized in insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and then I kind of did a little bit of a reroute. I went to uh, Grant Thornton, which is a medium-sized firm, and I did tax there. Um, so it kind of brought everything uh, full scope together. Um, so I kind of got both backgrounds in insurance, tax, and, uh, and brought it all together. So. You guys got any uh, accountants in your family? Um, yeah, my dad's actually an accountant. I figure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. you, yeah. you, you just don't wake up wanting to be an accountant. No, you don't no, wake definitely up. not. No. Looking at those numbers all day long, right? <laughs> yeah. We don't really look like accountants, do we? So, I mean, sometimes it's like, you're, you know, were you born being an accountant? You never know. So, you never know. You never yeah, know. no, I hear you. Our dinner conversations are pretty funny, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's all tax. <laughs> it's all tax, I'm sure. Um, well, that's good. At least you got your dad with some experience. If you, if you had some concerns or some questions... Uh, he's a good advisor for Absolutely. you guys, so I, I'm sure that that works out well for you. All right, so l why don't we just, let's get right into it, right? Because there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to taxes. Um, and, and there's many different stages. And I, and, and I want to base your tax advice, yes, through business ownership or being an entrepreneur and how we can, you know, uh, build on corporations to avoid paying as much taxes. And they try to do it and, and, and save that money as much as possible. Uh, one of the big, uh, big components for myself is, within real estate, you know, and I want to educate people is ways of avoiding and paying tax when you sell your your primary resident or, or have an investment properties or you're in the fix and flip business. Uh, and and I think one of the first components is, and we'll break it up in stages, right? And we'll, we'll break this down for, for a first time buyer. And a lot of first time buyers right now want to get into assignment sales. And these assignment sales, the government has been really cracking down on people trying to evade paying those taxes, right? Because what happened in the past was you would go to a pre-construction site, you buy a condo from one of these developers that we're going to close in four years. And prior to closing, you try to get that paper and flip it over to a new buyer at a profit. When it came to closing the transaction, the new buyer would close under their name. Now you have an essential profit uh, that, that was made from the, original purchaser. So let's just base it at $100,000. That person was never declaring any taxes at that point in time. The government started to catch on that, right? And then they were saying, well, no, we want to see the original purchase and sale agreements. Can you elaborate on, on, are you seeing a lot of that still happening where people want to try to avoid paying that tax when they flip their paper? Uh, can, can you maybe elaborate on how the taxes work when it comes to an assignment sale? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, that's one area in real estate tax that the government has really started cracking down on. And like you said before, it all came down to the taxpayer's primary intention. So, you know, when you initially put an offer in on a pre-con construction condo, you know, what was your primary intention? Are you looking to move in as a primary residence? Are you buying as an investment property and so forth? So from there, they would kind of, see how they would tax it upon the eventual assignment sale and the, the accrued gain you have on the property and so forth. So before it used to be, you know, if you had the primary intention of living there, but then when it came time to move in, um, you know, it didn't work out. Maybe you moved or your, your, your job moved and, or maybe you have a family. Now you can't fit in a condo. So you can assign that sale and essentially pay capital gains tax on the accrued gain. But what the government noticed was that a lot of times people started doing these assignment sales, paying these capital gains when their primary intention really wasn't to really move in there. Instead, they just want to flip it for a profit. So whenever the government sees that, you know, they step in and they say, well, hold on. Now you're in the business of flipping these assignment sales. So instead of being 50% tax, they tax you at 100%. And it's funny you bring this up because there's brand new rules, too, that the government just released. Because another area in tax that a lot of people don't know about assignment sales is whether or not to charge HST. So we can't explain how many times we've had clients who... You know, it comes time, you know, we're in April now. They say, oh, by the way, I, you know, I signed a property in the year. I made $100,000. Okay, did you charge HST? No, I didn't have to charge HST and so forth. Well, and then you look at the facts and you say, well, actually, you should have charged HST. So now the taxpayer is on the hook for paying that HST. So there's two new rules that I kind of want to I want to share. Um, the first one is any assignment sale that's entered into after uh, January 1st, 2023, um, if you flip it within 12 months, automatically it's 100% business inclusion income, 100% taxed. On the whole amount. On the whole amount. And the Profit. second one is... Prior to that, sorry, I just want to say what the rules were prior. 
it would be considered as a capital gains tax, if I'm not mistaken. So you're going to get charged at 50% of those profits. Yeah, depending or, oh, on, sorry, 25% of the full amount. You got it. And and depending on the situation, I mean, like if the government, the government could always come back and reassess you and say, no, you were always had the primary intention of entering into the assignment zone, flipping it for a profit. So it would have been a hundred percent tax regardless, but even the, you know, people, you know, they got away with maybe doing the capital gains because that, you know, their primary intention was to move into that property. Mm -hmm. And then the second one was um, in May of 22, 2022, any assignment sale for a pre-con or a substantially renovated property, you now have to charge HST regardless of your primary intention. So we're going to see, and this is going to be one that, you know, it's interesting to see as we get into April, this is going to be one that I think we're going to start to see where a lot of people probably did assignment sales in the year and then, you know, here, here's, you know, here's the purchase sale. Here's what I made. And they didn't charge HST. And I think we're going to run into some problems with that. So they have to charge HST to the new buyer that buys that paper. So if it's not a hundred, that's a hundred thousand profits. Are you basing the HST on the profits or are you, ba are you basing the HST on the value? The value, the assigned value, whatever yeah. you assign. The assigned value, right? Assigned so if I assign it, if I bought it for 500, but now I'm assigning it to you at 600, mm -hmm. it's 600,000 plus HST. Exactly. That's a huge right. component there, mm -hmm. right? That you got to be collecting. If you're not collecting that, exactly, you got to eat it after. You got to eat it. Yeah. You're talking close to seventy thousand dollars on, on based on Absolutely. a six hundred thousand dollar valuation, give or take approximately. Percent, yeah. That's a big number. Oh yeah, right. Um, and Mark brought up a good point too. I mean, it, it's it's also based on your history. So if you are in the fix and flip industry and you can or you can just continue to do these things, and you've you've done you flipped like ten assignment sales, you're probably in the business of flipping assignment sales. So you're for sure gonna have to charge HST, and it's gonna probably be a hundred percent income. Right? Wow. It just depends on your history. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, uh, you know, look at that. Look at that timbit that, that our listeners are going to be able to pick up from the show right now. Um, and, and that's very important because that's going to go into your profit margin. So you got to, oh, yeah. you got to understand that if, if you're going to be flipping these things and you're going to flip over that paper to somebody else, you better be ready because it, is it based? So if I bought the property in 2021, mm -hmm. but it's closing in 2023, is it based on the closing of that transaction? Or is it based on the purchase price, uh, or, or the or when I when I purchase the property? Do you know? Yeah, that would be whenever. So it's based on you know any sale that happens after May twenty two. If it's a pre con, you have to charge HST, regardless charge regardless HST. of when you assign the original deal. Regardless when you sign it, you got wow. it. Okay, so uh, if, if that if that person who's buying that paper on that assignment is the intent is to move in and they are end users and it's going to it's going to be considered as their primary resident. Is the HST still applicable at that point? Sorry, if they the person who buys the property, the, the person who buys the paper, right? Yep. Yeah. So I, they, they they the person who bought the assignment, the assignee, ends up closing that transaction as their primary resident. Mm -hmm. Is there any HST implications at that point in time? Well, the HST that they pay, they'll be able to file rebates with the government, and they can get some of that HST back. No, but if it's a primary resident, I believe you don't pay HST, correct? No, because if it's a new if it's a if it's a new build. The builders are gonna have to charge HST on the final sale, regardless. So these buyers are now having to buy pay HST, regardless if it's your primary resident or not. Regardless, yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, if wow. you buy, if you buy, it wasn't like that before. If, it, if I was considered my primary resident, I wouldn't pay HST on that. No, if it's a if it's a new build. Yeah, if it's a new build and you're buying a new build from the builder, he has to charge HST. So either you charge HST and you file it's called a new property rebate and you can get back twenty four thousand dollars of HST on that, but you, they have to charge you HST because they're a builder, right? Yeah, but that's most of the time the builders in incorporate that within their purchase price. Exactly. You got it. Yes, right? exactly. So it's, that's already that, that it's already it's factored in. Exactly. It's already factored into that price point. You, but you can get some of that back as the as the person who's gonna be living in the home as a primary resident. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I thought it was only if I bought it as an investment, I would have to pay out the HST and then get a rebate back on that. So it's good that we're clarifying all this, right? And these are good candid conversations. Like this is the things that we talk about on a basis because I would like to educate my clients to understand that hey, when you buy these things, these are these are what's important. And this is a really, this, this conversation here is a really good understanding of why you need the right people to help you structure and advise you when you're going to make decisions before you actually make that decision, yeah. right? Because there's very, very important implications that could, could take place. Yeah. And you brought up a good point too. So, I mean, if you are buying these properties and you're not intending on living in there and you do file for this HST property rebate, there's a lot of my clients I'm seeing that are actually getting denied on that rebate because they didn't actually live in the property. Right, so you right. have to show intent. So if you do get audited for that, you're gonna have to show. Oh, okay. Did I? How, how can I prove that I lived in this property? Right. If you if you li if you actually lived in, it, it's very easy because you have utilities, you have Uber Eats bills to your house, you have all Changing that. You your can address. Prove, yeah, you can prove that you change your address there. You go to the gym in the, in the area, so you're able to prove that this HST pro new property rebate that you filed for, you actually deserve that rebate. Whereas some people are just buying homes and then flipping it and then 
they shouldn't have claimed that rebate, right? Well, that, and that's one of the reasons why they, they implemented this new anti-flipping tax, mm -hmm. right, for 2023. If you don't own the property for at least 12 months, it's always it's automatically considered a flip. Correct. What's what's the what's the tax implication on that? Well, the tax implication on that is basically that um, there's no really there's no loopholes anymore. So basically, you gotta you're going to get charged 100 percent tax on that property that you sold within those 12 month period, whether it's your principal residence um, or whether it's just like investment property. No matter what, before it could have been considered capital gains, 50 percent, right? But now it's going to be 100 percent. So, so I, I want to break this down. I'm going to give you a scenario, right? And I'm going to give you a real, you know, life case scenario that I deal with on a constant basis. When I deal with builders, right, and these guys build their custom homes, what, what it used to happen was, and we're going to get into some of this stuff, and I, it's gone as far as, and you know where I'm getting with I this, know, right? Because I can see you smiling right now. I know exactly now. where you're going, yeah. Right? The, I, I had one guy that was so savvy back in the day, and I'm talking eight, nine years ago, where to avoid paying tax where he wanted to consider it as his primary resident, he would tell the government that he was going through a divorce and that he would build one of the houses and put it under his name, keep his other primary resident under his wife's name. Ex-wife's name. Or or separated wife's separated, name. Well, they weren't ex yet, right? Paper, because they paper, were going through yeah. the, apparently <laughs> they were going to go through the, through the process, but he needed a house to live in. Yeah. So he ended up moving into the house that he built and then eventually ends up selling... And then all of a sudden it sells the house and says, oh, me and my wife decided to get back together to avoid paying taxes. Mm -hmm. That was one loophole that they would do and make it look like they were living inside the home. A lot of times, um, another point that I was, was going to try to make is that a lot of these builders would, would move into these houses, right? And, and actually pretend that it was their primary resident where it was and, and they wouldn't put it under a corporation and and try to avoid paying that tax um nowadays with this anti and, and they would do that within six months of the bill right so they make it look like it was their house they move in there show some clothing get the property staged and the government is now is now cracking down on all that because you're not going to be able to just live in that house for three four months pretend that it was your primary resident and then all of a sudden say oh i couldn't afford to live in this house anymore and then let me sell it Right. Uh, do, you, do you guys were you guys seen a lot of that stuff going on as well? Yeah, it's, it's funny because even before, you know, now you have to report anything you dispose of your primary residence, you have to report it on your personal tax return. But before this, this was implemented in 2016. Before that, what these builders, what people were doing was they were building these houses and putting it in their name, their wife's name, their kid's name and all everyone's name they can think of. And then yeah. they'd sell these homes and then they claim it as their primary residence, but it wasn't mm -hmm. reported anywhere. So the first sort of thing the government did to kind of put a stop on that was, okay, now you have to report a primary residence sale. So you get one per household, right. one, one year one year per household. So um, now the new anti-flipping rule, they even went a step further and they say that if you buy a primary residence, you move into it and you sell it within one, one year or 12 months, unless you have a specific reason as to why you mm -hmm. have to move and they give you a sh like a strict list of reasons, like if you know, if you're death, in, <laughs> death if you die, if you come insolvent, um, if you divorced. become divorced, yeah. disability, um, illness. Yeah, there's, there's a bunch of different factors or your family grows and you can no longer live in the condo. Unless you have a specific uh, reason as to why you moved, automatically they don't even question it. It's 100% income inclusion, your tax 100% on the gain. 100% on 100%, the gain. 100%, not even capital gain. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Right? So, so I just, uh, listen, I just want to make, make sure our viewers understand the difference when you're taxed at 100% versus a capital gains tax. Can, can maybe Luke, you want to give us some insight on that? Yeah, for sure. Basically, like um, essentially, it's a capital gain is fifty percent of whatever your your gain on the profit. So let's say it's at a hundred thousand dollars. This is your cost, and you sold it for two hundred thousand dollars, right? You would pay twenty five percent on the gains on the extra hundred thousand, right. compared to paying full hundred percent income, which you're not going to get taxed at the full hundred thousand dollars compared to the fifty thousand dollars, <laughs> right? So that's a big difference. For it's sure. huge. It's Massive. huge, right? So so I, I want. I'm just gonna you know kind of. Uh, make it a lot easier to explain. If I made $200,000 in profits, I'm paying on 50% of the 200,000. So I'm gonna be paying 25% on 50% of my profits, so on the $100,000. So at 100, I would be paying $25,000 in taxes. Yeah. Yeah. Today on the new flipping NT rule, I'm paying a full, on the 200, 50%, no, 25% on the $200,000, so my taxes would be $50,000, correct? So it, it, it's essentially on your profits. If you have a $100,000 profit, like you were saying, 
this is in personal too, right? So if it's in your, per, it goes into your personal income. So it depends on your personal tax rates as well, Got it. right? Wow. So if you're in a low income tax bracket, you may pay, not be paying that much, but if you're, if you have a $250,000 job, now you go and flip this home personally and you have a hundred thousand dollar gain, maybe you're paying 53% on that hundred thousand, right? So it's a full income inclusion as opposed to 50%, which is a capital gain, right? So you're going to get, you're going to get hammered double tax on that essentially, right? So there's going to be a lot of builders, let's say, let's call it, you know, majority of them are builders, right? And this is what they, what they, this is how they make their money is what they're going to try to do then. And they're always going to try to find loopholes. So another loophole may be is, okay, well, let's say they own their primary resident and then they go and build a house. Can they then go and claim, move into that house for 12 months, consider that their primary resident and then sell that house and then move back into their original home? Well, you can't have two primary residents at the same time. So it's one per year. So you're saying they're going to keep their original home? Yeah, let's say they want to rent it out or Airbnb it. Yeah, so there's there's a certain do you want to touch on the forty five two rules with that maybe? Oh yeah, so I, I understand what you're We're saying. We're getting really in depth here, yeah, but, yeah. I, but you know I'll this is cool light. because these are the type of the conversations that need to be had, and mm-hmm. people need to understand this is what happens within our industry within the vaccines, and why you need people like you guys to help you through this process before you make these decisions. Yeah, real estate, uh, you know, real estate tax is one of those areas. It's it's very complex, and there's a lot of really mm-hmm. fine detail rules that a lot Correct. of people don't know. And then you know, after the fact, they get hit with these taxes. Like you know, I don't know why I'm paying all these taxes. And why didn't you call me? Exactly. Yeah. And you say, oh, we should have called us. We should have called. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now it's like, hey, Mark, I got to do this. What do I got to <laughs> do, right? Or Matthew, this is this is what's happening right now. How do I position myself before I make that decision? But you're being smart. You're calling us before you do something. I beat right? smart because I've already learned that I paid too much tax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's okay. But as, as long as, like you said, this is all about education, right? So as long as you're exactly. educating yourself to call the right person and make sure you're still making that call to kind of educate yourself before going to make a big purchase for right. for a property, let's say, or if you already have another property and you want to claim this one, your principal residence, maybe it's it's better that you consult with someone because for principal residence, like we were saying, you get one per year. So if you have a cottage property and a, a principal residence in Toronto, you might want to look at where the bigger capital gain might be when you go allocate that principal residence to that property, right? Because if your cottage is up in Muskoka and you have like, and you bought it for a hundred grand, it's worth, I don't know, I'll call it two mil now. Let's just say like crazy. Um, you have a $1.9 million capital, like $1.9 million capital gain. Whereas if you just have a Toronto property, maybe it's in a certain area and it hasn't gone up that much in 10, 15 years, it's only gone up by 200 grand. You might not want to allocate those years for your principal residence to that property, your home in Toronto. You might want to allocate it to the one in Muskoka. Right, so as long as with the principal residence, as long as you've lived in it one day throughout the year, and it's your personal use property, you can allocate that principal residence to that property. Am I allowed to have a primary residence plus a vacation home to consider as? Will it be tax free at that point, or or still my vacation home would still be considered where I have to pay tax on that? So you have the two, right? But let's say you had let's say you had two. So you have your let's vacation property yep. and you have your home, your, your normal home in Toronto. Okay, you you only get one principal residence exemption or declaration per year. Right, so if you own them for ten years and you're going to sell them both at the end of ten years, you can only allocate those ten years. There's another rule for a plus one year, but you can only allocate those ten years to one of the properties. So you would prefer to allocate all ten of those years to the property with a two million dollar gain, as opposed to the property with only a hundred thousand dollar gain, because mm-hmm. you're going to save two million dollars of tax, mm-hmm. and you'll pay full tax on the on the on the one you have in Toronto. But at least now the one the property with the bigger capital gain in Muskoka, you're not paying any tax on. As long as you lived in it throughout and you you went you stayed in it w- one day out of the year, every year, and you actually vacated it, then you're okay. Nice. Right? I mean, there's certain sp- like specific fact case scenarios, obviously, per person. You, you want to consult an individual that has proper tax planning advice before you go and do these things to make sure that you meet those rules. But that's something you can do with two properties. If you if you lived in both, you can allocate your principal residence as such. Okay, so let's go back to the, the original scenario that I was talking about. If a builder had a primary resident, right? And now he goes and builds another house. And to avoid paying the government taxes, he has it under his name, right? And him and his spouse, he builds the house. He moves into that other house. He either rents his current home that he lives in or he Airbnb's and bees it as more of an investment point of view. He moves into that house for 12 months. He sells that house after the 12 months, moves back to his home. Does he have exemption and can he, can he consider that as his primary resident? I know these are tough questions. Maybe they're not tough questions. I don't know. But this is what this show is about. We want to get really in depth. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny because you know we we get those questions from our clients all the time. You know, let's the what if scenarios. Let's the say what if scenarios. The what if scenarios. Exactly. Enjoying this episode? Subscribe to our channel and leave us a comment down below to let us know what you want to learn next. 
Make sure you're following our Instagram and TikTok to stay up to date on our new episodes every Friday. Let's say exactly what you said, you know, okay, I, I bought a house. Uh, let's say on the 13th month, because the rule is if you sell it within 12 months, unless you meet the rules within it. So we're staying within our rules. We're staying within the guidelines and the bylaws. We get this question all the time. You know, what if I sold it in the 13th month? Well, then we look back and say, well, it all comes down to position, right? And the CRA, they can challenge you. Technically, yes, you fall out of that 12 month rule, but the CRA can go look, okay, what was your actually actual primary intention? So in your, in your scenario with the builder, this, this individual has a history of building homes um, he builds a new custom home, moves into the home with him and his wife. They sell it on the 13th month, right? The first day they sell it. What do you think the CRA is going to come back and say? That this was an intent to flip. You got it. Yeah. They'll look at history. They look at all sort of that stuff, right? And it's funny you brought up another point, a very interesting point. Um, when you change your use of your primary residence. Um, so if you have a primary residence and then you change your use. So let's say you go from primary res- residence to a rental property. In the eyes of the CRA or the the tax law, whenever you change the use of a property, you're deemed to have disposed that property. And it's something that a lot of taxpayers don't know. And it's something that we advise our clients because we see it a lot of times. We have individuals who have primary residence and, you know, maybe they outgrew that primary residence, but they want to keep it as a rental property. So as soon as you change your use, you're deemed to have disposed it. And whenever you're deemed to have disposed something, you are subject to pay tax on the accrued gain from date of purchase to date of you're deemed to have disposed it. Wow. So there's actually a, a pretty neat rule that the CRA allows you. It's, it's called a 45-2 election or a 45-3 election, depending on which way you're, you're going from the use. If you're going from primary resident to income producing or income producing to primary resident. And essentially, you file this election with the CRA, notifying them that say, hey, I had a primary resident. I'm no longer living in this primary resident. I'm now renting it out. So I'm, I'm uh, looking to elect for a 45-2 election. So what the CRA will do is they'll say, okay, they'll accept your election. And from there, you're allowed to rent out your property without triggering any tax mm-hmm. upon the deemed disposition. Got it. And the, la- the last part of that rule, which is the, the pretty neat part that a lot of people don't know, is when you elect for the 45-2 election, you, the CRA gives you an additional four years of principal residence to use on that property. Oh, yeah. Wow. So maybe give like a yeah. like a fact case scenario or like a situation where someone can maybe, for example, even if someone, let's say you bought a principal residence, you plan on living there, then you got to move away to school, or you got to move away, and you and you're not and you're not going to be staying in the same kind of city or whatever, so you can't be there. What you can do is you can rent out that property, file the election Mark just mentioned, and then for four, let's say for four four years goes by, and you have to sell that property now, you can sell it and pay no ta- no capital gains tax, even though it's been a rental property for four years. So that's another loophole, or well, not loophole, but that's another way you can be educated so that if you do have to leave your property that's your primary residence, you can still treat it as a rental property for four years, but you won't pay any tax. Because you initially lived in it first and it was your primary residence. You filed the election, like Mark mentioned, and now you have four years of capital gains, accrued capital gains tax-free. Yeah, people would ask, well, why would they do that? And I can see the point why would somebody would do yeah. that. What happens if I decided I wanted to do that, move my family into another house, build a house for myself, but... All of a sudden, my family and I don't like where we live. Mm -hmm. And we want to move back to the house that we originally came from. At least it gives us that time frame to make that decision, you know, and we didn't have to or be forced into selling a house just because, you know, to avoid paying taxes on it. Absolutely. Even even if you wanted to, like, um, if you buy a house for a job that you're taking, and then let's say you get fired, what happens? Yeah. Right? Exactly. So that's a good... uh, we see it we see it a lot um we have you know individuals come you know okay i sold the property in the air rental property and I, I always ask the question you know did you used to live in this property and they say yeah i used to live on it i'd say okay did your old accountant file a 45 to election for you they're like oh i don't know what this is what are you talking about and i'm like oh well you know it's you know it's late now you know you can you can file it late and there's gonna be penalties and they may accept it they may not the cra but i'm not gonna get into that but you know it, it's it always you know i always feel for my clients because you know if they got the proper advice from the beginning you know, those five years of capital gains now they're paying on, they could have been tax-free on the sale of the yeah. rental property. Let's yeah. be real. We're in, we're in Vaughan and we're in Toronto. Like, four years of accrued capital gains, sometimes it because it's substantial, Not right? Yet. So taxes on that could be substantial. So it's a big, it's a big cash savings. Right. Listen, this is some awesome, some awesome advice. I'm going to spin it now on something else and, and uh, something that happens quite often um, in, 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 for real estate agents. And, and when we're providing education to, to our clients, when it comes to investing in properties and how the tax end up not paying any tax on their investments and why I advise people to try never to sell their, their, their residencies or, or their investment properties that they have and maintain them is because you're never going to replace the cost value that you purchased on that. 
and and the amount of tax that you would pay if you sold your investment property outweighs the fact that if you actually re-leverage that property and reuse it into another property instead of selling it and wanting to make other investments on it because to avoid the tax because there's 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 tax implications if i own an investment property or one of my clients owns an investment property and they had it for five years and they've made a half a million dollars in profits within that within that time frame and they sell it two factors here it all depends on how ownership was provided correct what what do they have it under their personal name or if they have it under a corporation right if i own the property personally what are my tax implications on that and secondly if i own it under a corporation that property what's my tax implications on that the reason why i'm going this i'm sure you guys can understand is 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 it more advisable for somebody if they're going to buy an investment property do they buy it as a corporation or they buy it personally Mm -hmm. that's something i just kind of want to give somebody some education i mean it depends that's the number one the number one thing it depends on your personal situation it depends on your personal income and it depends what you're looking for with those properties if you want liability protection sometimes it might be better to have it in a corporation because the corporation owns it itself as opposed to you personally too right so there's multiple different factors i mean you also got to be careful that where you do buy it like let's say for example you buy it personally if you want to move it into your corporation you might have to pay land transfer tax right so those are decisions you want to make before you go and buy the property like you're mentioning right and sometimes now if you're having an investment property in a corporation, it's not always the most advantageous thing to do as well, too, because the rental property and rental income is considered to be investment income. And investment income within corporations are taxed at a high rate, right? So there's obviously expenses and other deductions that can reduce that investment income. But um, it just depends on your personal scenario. Because if, you per- if you're an individual and you don't have much income personally, it might be more beneficial for you if, they have like, if you actually have a good cash flowing rental property and has some income to keep it personally. Because your rate of tax personally, if you don't have much other income, is going to be quite low. Whereas if it's in a corporation, you're going to have to pay investment income, taxes on it, which is higher. And then in order to get some of that tax back without getting too complicated, you have to pay a dividend to yourself and kind of, you don't really get the advantage of that deferral. But in a scenario, do you want to maybe explain a little bit of a scenario where it's more advantageous to have a, uh, a property in a corporation? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I love this conversation because we get asked this question all the time because you have, you have clients who come to you with a very profitable operating company. So let's give an example of a contractor. You have a contractor who obviously is in the business of real estate, you know, they fix, they fix and flip homes. And they, they accumulate this wealth in a corporation and they say, you know, Mark, you know, what do I do with this money? You know, and, you know, they say, I want to invest. I want to invest. OK, what do you want to invest in? I want to invest in real estate. OK, but I'm going to buy properties in my personal name. And I say, well, hold on. Anytime you go from corporation to personal, you cross that fine line, you're going to trigger tax implications. So what I always advise clients, and this is sort of like what Matt was saying, it depends on the scenario. If you have like an operating company. And it has a lot of wealth, a lot of cash built up, and you want to start investing that cash. What you can do is integrate in your corporate structure, structure something like a holding company, and you could flow those funds from your operating company to your holding company tax free. Now, Learnings. obviously, there's a there's more you know there's complications. More it, there's yeah. more to it. It's not that simple. But for the most part, what we always tell our clients is that now, essentially, what you just done, if you want to you know if you want to use two hundred thousand dollars of your corporate from your operating company, your corporate funds, Mm -hmm. to invest in a rental property. Mm -hmm. If you do it corp to corp, you now have $200,000 to go buy a property. Whereas if you were to do it personally, to pull that money out of your corp personally, you're going to have to pay tax at 50% on that money. So right, now you're it's coming from the core personally. Yeah, exactly. You cross that yeah. fine line. Right. Always, always think of it as a fine so line. So now the money that you pull out, you're going to have to pay tax on it. Let's just say 50% for simplicity's sake. So Correct. now you only have $100,000 of buying power to go buy that property in your personal name. So that's where the main advantage we see more so, especially if you're involved in real estate and you have, because eventually, you know, what we like to see, it doesn't even if you're involved in real estate, if you have any sort of operating company that you have a lot of cash accumulated in that operating company, you can set up something like Mm -hmm. a property co or a holding company. Yeah. 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 And then, and to move it, so you got to be careful because you got to know how you want to build your real estate uh, portfolio as well, because if you're going to be buying properties under your personal name and then, and then it becomes advantageously to, to move it to a corporation for tax reasons, what happens is then you trigger land transfer tax Correct. again, right? right? And and that's what you want it because, and you'll be paying land transfer tax on the new value if that property has right. gone up, right? You know, half a million dollars mm-hmm. more. So that, that yeah. you know, that could be a very big tax implication as well. So you got to be very careful on how you position yourself when you're getting into the game. And that's why, you know, when, when I sit down with my clients and say, hey, Nick, I want to I wanna invest into the real estate market, um, I, I have this amount, much money, you know, we'll look at, okay, what's your, what's your financial position, you know, and how best should we, you know, 
position you to buy and what name should we buy it on? Should we open up a corporation and buy this under a corporation, right? And you sign as a guarantor for that corporation to get you the financing and the mortgage on it. Um, or do we keep it under your personal name and buy it? I think yeah. you're, you're, you're allowed up to five properties personally that any A lender bank would give you, right? So right. if you went to, to any of these A lenders, they'll give you an exception up to five personal properties. Yeah. After that, you have no choice but then yeah. we'll put it under business. a corporation, yeah. I believe, right? Yeah, and that's a special thing I like, even when we're working with you, like you kind of, you think about these things for your clients as well, right? So it's like, even though you're, you're working with them and they're gonna be signing a deal, you think about it, maybe it's like, okay, maybe we should put this in a corporation. Like you have the know-how to kind of think about that. And then, okay, maybe you should talk to Mark, Matt, Luca, before you go and do this thing, because then it'll be you'll be in a more beneficial standpoint. So you have that like that transparency to be able to do that, right? It's important, yeah. Exactly. So you now you have this kind of system of individuals that all work together that can help you and your clients kind of basically turn it all together and have the most efficient tax scenario or even save them the most money they possibly can, right? Yeah. So that's kind of what it's about. And then also we were saying before, even to bring it home more so it's more real estate related, you have a, if you have a real estate agent, right? So real estate agents can now have corporations. You can be a personal real estate corporation itself too, right? So before, whereas uh, a few years ago, you couldn't have a corporation, yeah. right? So now you have all these real estate investors. Most of them sometimes are real estate agents. So real estate agents, number one thing you want to invest in is obviously real estate. That's your craft, right? I tell um, you, the best deals out there are scooped up by real estate agents. That's what I'm saying. Time, right? yeah, so bread and butter. They're exposed to it, right? They're yeah. exposed to it all the time. So that's yeah. what you specialize in. Why would you invest in something else? When you see you see a property, it's like, oh, I'm going to scoop up that property, right? Now you can do that with your, your pre-tax profits in your corporation, your after-tax profits in your corporation. Whereas before, if you're a good realtor and you're making 250000 300000 you're paying 50% on, on the marginal tax rate on that income. Yeah. Now, like, your buying Trust power... Trust me, I know. Uh, see? <laughs> <laughs> your, 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 bu- your buying power has gone down significantly. Yeah. Whereas yeah. if you have it in the corporation, you still have that, those funds. And if you can get lending in your corporation, now your, your buying power is a lot, a, lot, a lot bigger. Yeah. When right? I first started in the industry, I needed to be a broker before I was able to open see? a corporation. Exactly. Or else every, all my yep. income was, gener- was paid Correct. through my brokerage to me Got personally... It. And now I'm paying personal income tax on that mm-hmm. money. And yeah. and just to put it in perspective, like let's like keep it simple. If you're if you're a realtor in a corp, or if you're any operating company in a corp, you pay tax at twelve percent as opposed to at the the corporate tax rate, which is very beneficial in Ontario, um, and then up to a certain five hundred thousand dollars mm-hmm. without getting too um, into into in depth in it. But at twelve percent as as opposed to if you're a re, if you're a realtor making two hundred fifty thousand dollars in a corporation, you're paying at twelve percent. But if you were taking that personally, you're now paying a fifty two fifty three percent. Right. Yeah. For a small scenario, like for example, even a hundred thousand dollars in a corp, when, after you pay tax, you're left with eighty eight thousand. If you do that, if you do that personally, that extra marginal income personally, you have way less money to play with or go invest. One hundred percent. Right. Because that eighty eight thousand turns into fifty thousand or whatever forty five thousand exactly. whatever that the marginal number, after your expenses and, yeah. and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and it and then and and leaving in the corp. Now it's like you said, going back there, you can get that money from your prac, run it into a whole co, mm-hmm. and now that whole co can now start investing, and yeah. you have a bigger mm-hmm. buying power to to go invest yeah. within other properties, and and I guess it's the same thing with with even uh, uh, contractors or or a lot of these guys that go do fix and flips, mm-hmm. uh, where where they have those opportunities as well, correct? Yeah. Yeah, they can do the same thing. You can do the same thing in like a development company. You can you can create all those corporations for that specifically, right? The key thing is like we were saying before, and Mark mentioned, it's all about your intention, right? So you're not gonna be able to have capital gains taxes if you're a builder because mm-hmm. all you do is you constantly fix and flip homes, mm-hmm. right? There's obviously GST, HST uh, implications that we can talk about later, but it gets it gets difficult. But um, yeah, like we said, if you're if you're a builder, you you might be better off to have it in a corporation because that income is gonna be 100 percent income to you anyway. So if you if you're in a corporation, you and you you build something, you have a $500,000 profit. You're only paying 12%. Whereas if you had it yeah. personally, then you're... Yeah. And a lot of my conversations, even with my investor clients, and when they come up to me, and I truly say this, and people are like, well, you know, you're a real estate agent. Your job is to sell their mm-hmm. properties. If they're coming to you to, you know, say, hey, I want to sell my property, and you're advising not to sell your property, like, you know, I, I don't even consider myself a salesperson. And I don't want to be... I, I'm a consultant. Yep. Right? Same way you guys are consultants uh, when it comes to taxes... Uh, the way I go to my lawyer uh, for, for, for legal issues that, that may, 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 may come up, uh, he consults to me. When somebody comes to me and somebody says to me, Nick, I want, I've, I've had this property. Uh, I've, there's, there's a lot of equity that's built, built inside there. I want to sell it. I want to get that million dollars and reinvest it into something that's going to give me better returns. A lot of my conversations is, well, if we look at the returns on this, let's see what you're left with, right? So we'll break it down for them. If you're... If you bought the property for a half a million dollars, and today it's worth a million dollars, now we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have capital gains on that on that on on half a million dollars, right? On that profits, 
If you take the capital gains on that, we're talking about on, on half a million dollars, roughly, what would that number be, guys? A half a million dollar capital gain? A capital gain tax, yeah. At 250 grand? $250,000. Yeah. Why pay the capital gains tax, right? Why not go to your bank, re-leverage that money, pull as much equity as you can instead mm-hmm. of paying two hundred fifty. Because that 250000 once you sell it, it's gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Sunk cost. So what's the... What, yeah, exactly. So why not take... Go to the bank, re-leverage that money, that $250,000, still maintain the main uh, ownership of that property, and then go and reinvest it into something else. Yeah. That's right? the whole topic about tax deferral, right? Like, tax deferrals, right? That's yeah. the main concept of corporation. Yeah. And that's like you were saying, that's like that Burr method too, where you buy, you, you, you renovate it, you refinance it, right? So you can you can continuously keep doing that and you never pay any tax, right? Because refinancing is not a disposition. Correct. So if you re- refinance, you, you you now have those funds in your corporate, if you're in a corporation, to go and put it into another property. You can just continuously roll that over and roll it over. And right? as you keep deferring it, the longer it goes, the more ta- the more wealthier you are, right? In 10 years, you'll be a lot more wealthier than hopefully now, right? So you're, you're instead of paying tax now, you might as well pay tax later on when you're able to sell a property, maybe, you know, pay for the taxes on this property and, and keep going and keep going. Of course, right? and, and, and hopefully it's increased another exactly. half a million dollars on top of that. Now, <laughs> yeah, the money exactly. that it's increased to, you're gonna be mm-hmm. able to pay that tax off anyway. And now you, you just made 100 percent of the profit, and you still own ownership of that home. So it. there's so many, and this is why having you guys in to make people understand mm-hmm. that there's other different ways. Uh, now listen, if you need the money, you need the money, and if yeah, you gotta sell, you sell. You know, sometimes you need to take some chips off the table. I get it, uh, and there's certain reasons within life that that mm-hmm. would, would would make you want to do that. But if there are ways that you can maintain that property and consider keeping it and releveraging it, if you get qualified, well, you know, there's qualifying process and all that stuff, but. Um, I definitely feel like like there's 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 ways around it, and the rich don't like to no. sell, and the rich yeah. like to maintain their properties, mm-hmm. and this is what we want to educate here on the show. So, um, yeah, man, this is awesome, guys. Uh, where are we here yeah, now? There's so, a lot, a lot going on. There's right a lot now. going so, on here, man. So, I got so much for you I guys. Can see yeah. Yeah. We can we can run like three shows on you. Yeah. Like, let's end this one. Let's get into a part two right away. You know what I mean? <laughs> then we'll start billing you, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I saw all my Nick's, questions. See the next right? face. He's like, I'm learning right now. Cut, I can cut, see cut, it. Cut, he's cut, so cut, in. Yeah, we got Mark like, man, this guy's asking me all the Check questions that this guy wants to know. So no wonder he's here. They invited me on the podcast. I'm like, this is the best way to get free service. You know, so uh, the sale of residential properties um, that the owner has and held for 12 months. We talked about that. Yep. Uh, what are the new un- unreused housing tax flipping obligations? Underused housing tax, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, like you mentioned, there's a new tax now, and it just came out recently part of the the more recent budget that happened last year. So it's basically a 1% tax on the fair market value of a property, for residential property, and the main focus of that tax that was reintroduced is more so, it's on foreign buyers. And foreign buyers, when they're buying residential property in Canada, they want to kind of eliminate that within the Canadian scope of real estate to kind of spur uh, spur the, growth, the real estate growth for mm-hmm. actual Canadians, right? So if we have foreign buyers that own residential properties and they're vacant, there may be a 1% tax that those foreign buyers have to pay on those taxes. But the key thing to think about here too is the way it was le- the way the legislation was written. Which is nothing really though. Yeah, 1% on fair market. Like yeah. they don't care. No, no, no. no they're, still gonna, they're still gonna buy <laughs> yeah. it. I mean, Canadian real estate. <laughs> they're making more it. just on the exchange of their dollar. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Right. Well, the Canadian dollar is cheap. So, I mean, yes. like we were mentioning too. So it's like, you, and the key thing with this is it's even though it's geared toward fo- foreign buyers, even if you're a Canadian resident individual, you're still going to have that issue with like, you still ha- might, may have to file as a Canadian resident, whether you're an individual or whether you're a corporation. If you're a corporation, you have to actually file this, re- this underused housing tax return, even though you're not foreign or even though it's not vacant. So there's certain specific rules and don't take it as tax device because you have to go through the case scenario of each and each individual property because it is a filing that you do on a property by property basis. So if you, for example, just an easy, an easy, an easy case is if you have a corporation, let's say a rental property or two in there, residential rental property, you now have to file this underused housing tax return or else you're, you're liable for penalties and significant penalties, which can be in a corporation, it's $10,000 per property. If you don't file and you're late, on filing this underused housing tax return per property in that corporation. So it depends on where you who's on title of those properties, whether it's an individual, whether it's a corporation, whether it's a partnership, whether it's in a trust relationship, some of those scenarios you may have to you may have to file the return. You won't pay any tax, but you still have to file your your or you're liable for those um, underused housing tax act penalties and late filing fees, which is substantial. So yeah. this is going to impact a lot of real estate investors who have these residential rental properties in corporations. 
because you know we see it all the time yeah. you know you have you have investors who have five ten properties 15 20 so every single property has to file this underused housing tax yeah. form and if you don't file it the penalties are substantial yeah, yeah. so it's it's it, it the whole the whole so spirit that form of it, basically is a declaration stating that you have rental properties and are any of these rental properties sitting vacant you got Correct. it. And held yeah. by a form. So if you're a Canadian, if you're a Canadian resident with a Canadian resident corp, you're not going to pay tax like Matt said, but you still have to file. So the spirit of it was to, you know, for the foreign buyers who own residential real estate. And it's vacant, and, just sitting around. And vacant. And, it, and there was a lot of that. Exactly. And there still is, right? And there still is. So they got to prove ways around that that property was, was either rented out yeah. and generated some income because they don't, and, and a big purpose of this and, and why they've implemented this is because of the, the housing crisis that we're dealing with currently Absolutely. right now, and there's a real big shortage of supply. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think this this shortage of supply is going to last for the next four or five okay. years, in, in my opinion. Uh, and with the amount of growth that, that's going to be expected for the for, for our Canadian economy, mm-hmm. there's no way that you're going to be able to support the amount of demand that's exactly. going to be there. And with with implementing this, you know, was, a, I think, a political campaign to say, hey, look, we're trying to make a difference and we're trying to help out with this housing mm-hmm. crisis. But I don't think it's going to yeah. do anything. I don't think it changes much. It's an expensive way to gather information, basically. It's just an expensive, yeah, yeah exactly. And it's cumbersome, too, yes. right? Because even as an individual, exactly. and you think you might yes. not even think it applies to you. But then, I mean, if, if you just own residential property through a corporation, you have to go file this return and you didn't know about it. And now you may be subject to $10,000 per property. So if you have 20 properties in a corporation, let's say, just for just for speak, you're going to have to file this. You might be liable for $200,000 of penalties. Ten thousand per property. So, right? do you have to file for each property? You have to file for each property. For each property. Yeah. So it's it's about who the title holder is. So the corporation in this case would be the title holder. But even in these scenarios where you have a nominee company that owns title of the property and a trust through a trust relationship, you're gonna have to file, right? You may not. You're not gonna pay tax because you you have that. You, there's there's certain exemptions to go through. I mean, we won't get too in depth, but you may have that filing obligation. If you have that filing obligation now, you may be subject to those penalties. And that's the main thing. And and just the spirit of that goes against what they're trying to what they're trying to like what they're trying to achieve. They're trying to achieve that basically get rid of vacant properties that are owned by foreign buyers. Whereas now you have this, these individuals that hold these properties and corporations that have to file this return, which makes it extra for them. And it's just more professional fees and more thinking about the more stress about certain filings. Yeah. Right. So it's just an extra thing to think about. And I mean, the good thing is they did it. So it was due April 30th and they did now extend it to October 31st. They didn't actually formally extend the deadline, but they did say that if you do file after April 30th, now 2023, you won't be subject to the late filing fees and penalties and interest related to those those filings. So that's the good thing, at least. And then there will be more information that comes out over the next few months that might alleviate some of the extra burden on people to, for their filings. So that's the good thing, at least. Man, we, we've uh, we've touched on a lot of uh, topics here today regarding that. Um, if there was a way that somebody needed some advice, uh, what's, what's the best way for somebody to reach you guys? Uh, you can go on our website, valentepasidi.com. And then there you can, you can go to our staff and we have all our emails there, our numbers, and you can give us a call. Come by the office. If you also have an Instagram account, Valente Pachidi. Oh, that's good. I have Pachidi. And there's good, and we did some good informational posts on there too. So there is stuff about the underused housing tax on there. There's stuff about the anti-flipping rules like we just mentioned. There's uh, rules on GST and HST on assignment sales and all those. So everything we kind of talked about right now, there's good infographics and little tidbits on there that can kind of help you if you want to further develop kind of what you learned today. So this is a busy time of year for you guys, eh? Yeah. Is, uh, I, I'm glad that you guys it. actually were able to spend some time to come into the office, especially at this time of year. Uh, can you explain to people why it's a busy time of year for you guys, especially uh, now? Uh, why is it a busy time, guys? I'm not too sure. <laughs> well, it's, it's, I have it's, to file it's, something soon, no? Yeah, yeah. Some, for something's getting filed, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah, personal tax personal season. Taxes. Personal tax yeah, season, right? So it. I hope everybody's working right now and filing their, their personal taxes. You're going to need to pay the tax, man. If you haven't paid Uncle Sam, Uncle Sam will come looking for you, right? So you get these guys on your side to make sure that when it comes down to paying Uncle Sam and he comes knocking on your door, you're going to be paying as little as, as you can. And I think uh, I, I'm glad to have uh, a wonderful group of guys on my side. Um, they're great advisors and consultants to myself, uh, and, and they really do help me out, and I really recommend their services. As you can see, they are very knowledgeable and educated through the process. But it was a pleasure to have you guys on the show, uh, and I hope that we can get into more because I'm sure we can get maybe three different parts on this. So Absolutely. this has been wonderful, guys. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Appreciate it. Looking to buy or sell? Call a team you can trust. Don't believe me? Our Google reviews say it all. Put us on your lawn, your house will be gone. TheOPTeam.com. 